Hi, guys. Yeah. Say hi to say hi to Diana and Kate and Heather. Hi, Frank. Frank, where's Lady Bean Card? The dog. Where's your dog? Okay, can you not hear us? Wait a minute. This is a problem. It's disconnected. I can hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> Hi, Krista. I'm glad you could hear me. I was I was worried uh, it was on my end. We don't think Frank can hear us. Frank, can you hear us? Hi there. Oh, there oh, you are. Frank. Hi, Frank. Hi there. Hello. <laughs> FYI, guys, we are recording. I will I will cut all the beginning. Uh, I'll I'll you know trim the video, but just so you know, we are a recorded session today. Just give us a few minutes. We're just waiting for Nancy.
Sorry guys, hang tight, okay? We're almost uh, starting, a few minutes. All right, guys, thanks for holding, okay? Let me introduce you to uh, Nancy Marini. And um, actually, you need the camera so you can, there you are. Okay, now we can see you. Awesome. I'm gonna share the screen, but say hi to everybody. Hi guys, how are you? Nice to virtually meet you. Who do we, how many we have online? So we have Evelyn, Frank, and Krista are online. And here we have Emily, Kate, and Heather. Hello guys. Right, and we're gonna keep this for education. Yes, so we are recording. All right. And let me, oh, hang on. I'm gonna share the screen. And you have, here, here's the remote. Oh, awesome. Thank you. On, it should be on. Okay, so. Just uh, give me a thumbs up that you could hear okay, okay. Awesome, thank you. All right, go ahead. I'm gonna put these guys in the corner over here. Or I don't know how the best. Eh, probably in the corner is fine. Okay.
Oh, did it skip? Did you do that? Did I go back There we go. All right. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Hi, sorry. We like crossed it and I actually sent you an email about what's happening. Yeah, that's why I said she's probably up and drop it. Yeah. Sending me an email. All right. How are you guys? All right. So I just kind of like turned on the topic. Go ahead. So how long have you been here? Heather, uh, 19. Awesome. Always in the ED? No. Where were you before? Two or three. How long have you been here? Two nine years. Yeah. Um, Kate, I've been here 12 years, and I've been in the about 12 years. Oh I started as a new grad, and never left. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Emily, I've been here three and a half years. All of you are here. Yes. All right. Well, my name is Nancy Marie. Do you mind if I close this? Yeah. Do you mind if I close this? Right. So, um, my name is Nancy Marie. I just joined here at Griffin. I'm going to talk about um, in October. And before that, um, I was a, a litigation attorney and partner at Hidel Tony Murphy and Bach, which is a litigation firm we represent hospitals, nurses, build nursing facilities before state, federal, and um, courts and the Department of Public Health. So all I know is litigation. Everything I look at, I think is going to end up in a lawsuit, which is like probably the worst way to live and why I don't <laughs> let my kids go to trampoline parks. <laughs> so, um, you know, when I uh, was first asked to do some documentation. The first request was relative to the, the new docs and residents and things like that. And Diana got and I got started talking. And she was like, you know, how do we document this? And this, there's always some concern. And I said, oh, I'll do a presentation. Um, and that's how, how this came to be about. But the best part of this is that it's interactive. So anyone on the interweb that has any questions, just say it out loud, unmute yourself. You guys just interrupt me. Um, I've yet to be offended um, my entire life on this earth. So I promise you, interrupting me won't offend me. Um, but and if you disagree with anything I've said, I love disagreement. I love some like talking back and forth. I'm not clinical. I know nothing about anything clinical. My only experience with clinical stuff is I would learn things in order to present them to juries. So I don't know the whole story. I just know enough to have gotten me to the jury and um, defense verdict. <laughs> Which is why I had to get out because it's sooner or later I'm going to lose and I couldn't handle that. <laughs> so um, no, so if you have any questions, please, please, please let me know because I know very, very little about very remote things and you guys I clearly disagree. So oh wait go back I do this every moment. Okay. So um what do you guys think the purpose of a medical record is? Take a picture of patients stay right. so pay the purpose of the patient's stay. So when you're writing your assessment or you're charting your assessment or your note is it a snapshot of the entire state or just that that encounter? Should go. It should document how go. Right. Yeah. So it's a snapshot in time of the care that you are providing, of the patient's presentation, of the plan as it stands at that time, right? So when you go back in time and you look at your medical record, you're going to be able to say exactly how the patient presented, what was said, what you did, and, and that snapshot in time, right? So that is, as far as I'm concerned, the purpose of the medical record, right? To have a snapshot. Also, because again, litigation background, it's exactly what you are going to have five years from now if you're ever to post, right? Because it's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be two years from now when the lawsuit is served. It's going to be five years when the lawsuit is served and the discovery has happened. They're finally getting around and asking people that were there some questions. All right, and how many patients do you guys see a day? A whole week, right? Yeah. You're not going to remember what you did five years ago. Right? I don't remember what I did for breakfast this morning, right? I don't remember how I drove here, right? I don't remember which stop signs I stopped at fully or which ones I maybe like didn't fully stop at, right? No, but it's true. You go through these things every single day. They're normal. They're how you process your, your day. And it's unlikely that some events are going to stick in your mind that you're going to be able to swear under oath. But you know what else? If it's not in the medical record, it didn't happen. So it doesn't matter if you believe it, you know you did it, you're 100% sure. If it's not in the medical record, it didn't happen. That's just the way it is. That medical record is going to be end all and be all at a trial, at a deposition. It's all you have. All right. And that's why it's like significantly important, not like significantly important, it is important. It is the end all and be all. So here's the purpose of the medical record um, to provide the patient care, right? Patient records provide the documentation basis for planning for patient care and treatment, right? That's like that. You'll get that in whatever book you want to go to or however. That's the purpose of the medical record, right? 
communications to communicate with the doctors, right? This is this is how the patient is presenting. It's to communicate to whoever the consulting position is going to be, to whoever the nurse is who's going to be picking up the shift, right? You're going to sign off. You're going to give that verbal cue. But before she sees the patient, what is she going to do? She's going to go in and she's going to read your notes, right? She's going to look at your assessments to see how the patient's doing. When the patient gets transferred up to the floor, what are they going to do? You know, look at your assessment. They're going to see, right? So it's a communication tool. I want someone else to know what this patient was like at this time. So when they're like, ooh, this blood pressure, I don't know. They're able to see, is that his baseline? Is he tanking, right? It gives them some information. The legal and documentation, right? If I, you know, um, if I could have rearranged this chart, this would be number one, right? Why? I'm looking at it completely differently. You guys have an obligation to the patient. I have an obligation to the hospital. Right, so I want everything to like be as perfect as can be in case that there's um, a lawsuit. These other two things, a lot of people care a whole heap about, but I'm not going to talk about today. Okay, very very important, I hear, but not for the purpose of this session. Okay, and we're going to delete that in case this ever ever goes anywhere. Alex, I think that the billing is the most important thing. Ellen, quality and and all those that's that's amazing. So we'll talk about it another day. So what should be included in your nurses' notes, right? Now, I know we're going to chart by exception, so we're going to talk about that in a little bit, right? And you're going to hear me say a whole lot of just because there's a whole bunch of little dots that you should be filling in, there's also the comment section, right? I live in the comment section. Lawyers live there. Why? Because that's how you can actually defend a case. You know who hates those comments? The other side, plaintiff's attorneys. They despise those comments. Why? Because that's how you explain the care that was rendered, okay? They see no comments as all you did was check boxes. I see comments as, no, 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 this is what they actually did, okay? And charting by exception and comments, they live in the same universe. They're not mutually exclusive. So what do I want you to keep in mind? I want you to keep in mind, will this help other staff members working with the patient, that communication aspect, right? Will it be able to give them information, right? I want you to think, is it accurate and factual? We're going to talk a little bit about things that are not necessarily accurate and factual, like opinions or feelings, right? Um, I often joke with my children. I have um, two boys, they're 11 years old, and one of them is very, very emotional and one of them is not, right? So whenever the emotional child comes to me, I have to say, okay, now can you tell me how George would tell me, right? So Anthony is very, very emotional. His brother is not safe. Tell me what George would say. Because George would say, I went downstairs and I stepped on a back. But Anthony's saying, <laughs> my foot is falling off, <laughs> right? So facts, accurate facts, right? Because <gasps> small enough might not accurately portray someone who is actually perfectly, right? So that's why it's really, really important to have that in your mind. And then will it help me remind, will it help me be able to testify at a deposition? All right. Every patient, no matter the care that you render, is a possible plaintiff. Okay. I am very, very, very um. When I, when I would prep witnesses or, you know, you get a lawsuit in, the docs are sad, the nurses are sad. I can't believe that this patient is doing me. I can't believe it. I did everything I could to this patient. I saved their life. They're still suing. Why? It's a business. If there is money to be made and people are going to try to make it lawyers. Scum of the earth. I can say that. I'm a lawyer. I married one. Yes. <laughs> horrible, horrible. There's money to be made. They're going to do it. Billboards, side of buses. It's expensive to advertise. They're looking to recoup their money. Okay. I have um, very, very high expectations that jurors will eventually see, hopefully have learned through this whole pandemic that doctors and nurses are not the enemy. At the same time, if there's money to be made, they will still see you. And that is it. So when you're documenting in the medical record, I want you to document in a way where you can say, if I need to testify, so what I'm doing right now, does this medical record accurately portray that treatment? Will I be able to say, this is what I did and this is why, and here it is. Right. So I'm going to go back to that. Ah, we'll just say. Okay. So, in connection with uh, my prior life, I've given this speech a couple of times to some other institutions. I've given it to the, um, the Yale institutions. I've given it to Milford Hospital before they became part of Yale. I've done Baptist Hospital. Lawrence Memorial, pretty much every single Athena skilled nursing facility in the state, Rhode Island as well. I have done um, a whole heap of them, okay? Even um, Silver Hill, 
So I've got them a good majority covered. Every single time I've given this, someone has said, ah, we can't chart like that. Our EMR rhythm with us. Or I've worked with Epic and they have that, but we don't have that, so we can't do it here. Every single facility hates their EMR, right? Even if they love their EMR, they hate it when I ask them to do certain things. It's always, no, 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 it's the EMR, right? So I'm gonna say, if you can't love the one, can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Because this a EMR is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. But also to remind you that we can make it what we want, right? We have these people and they can change some things and they can help us change some things if we need to make the EMR better to make it work better with us. Diana's great at kind of asking for certain things and knowing what to ask for and when to kind of not ask for things. But we have that ability, right? So if you are really, really, really wanting something to be done, ask for it, yeah? All right. Does anyone on, uh, on the internet have any questions? Now, has anyone here worked with other um, EMRs before? Tell me about what EMR you've worked with. Um, I was on squad or something, I think, for okay. a very short period of time. And then we were brought out and it was Epic. Epic, okay. Yeah, Epic seems to be like the, the one. And, and people who leave Epic love it, right? But when when you first had it, did you like it? No. Yeah, right? It's that same idea. Um, and I can, you know, you can always like pick and choose. A lot of it is a comfort level, right? People have a comfort level with a certain EMR. We've had this one for a while now. I think we've had it for about two years. So I'm sure that people today don't hate it as much as they hated it when they first got it. Um, but again, it's all, it's all there. But this is the idea that when we chart by exception, we just chart by exception, right? It's we chart the exception. If it's not there, it means it's normal, it's fine. So when you're asked the question, did this patient have um, pulses? You look in your notes, you say, clearly there's pulses. I don't know anything else. So yes, there's pulses, right? And it's like, because it's the exception, it's not there and there was no room to write it. But like Jello, there is always room for narrative. Always, always, always. And uh, here's my disclaimer, because you know, the lawyer, it's not one size fits all, right? Every single patient is different and how you give treatment to every patient is different, right? So what I'm gonna ask you to do is take what I'm saying and use it as tools, right? I'm not telling you how to document. I wouldn't know, I'm not a nurse, right? But I can give you these tools because I've seen what happens when people don't use these tools, right? I've seen that they are amazing, phenomenal, awesome nurses, but because that they're more focused, like they're supposed to be on providing care and treatment for the patient and maybe not necessarily going back and documenting what they did, they're unfortunately in an awkward situation where they're deposed and they can't specify in the medical record where to go. Um, I will often say, has anyone here been deposed? We've been deposed. So when you were deposed, um, I know you can not have a <laughs> So when you were deposed, um, did you feel like super confident? So it was an interesting case because it wasn't actually about my patient. It was simply because I was a charge nurse in the department at that time. The patient had had a fall. Um, but I didn't probably start questioning you to make you think you're questioning your own, like they're basically trying to trick you. So it's mm -hmm. like a day full of questions. And it's like every day, it's like, they're like making you repeat yourself and making you repeat the same thing. That, I mean, that's yep. their job. Ultimately. Yep. The lawyer's job is to attack your credibility, right? If they attack your credibility, what else are they attacking? Not right? So, um, even though my boys are 11, they still have their parents happy. Right, so one of them has a Pluto, and then the other one again, the one that doesn't really have a lot of like passion. He has a bear who's blue, blue bear, right? <laughs> so um, every time they're like upset or they're like uncertain in their home, they'll go and they'll get, you know, George will get his blue bear and he'll smell it, right? Smell it, he'll comfort himself with that stuff. Then it's adorable, and I, I never want him to stop because it's like, you know, gives me that glimpse of that child abuse. So, <laughs> so they do that, and what I notice is that they'll immediately like relax. Right? Like, I'm okay, I'm safe. At a deposition, your stuffy, your Pluto, your blue bear is the medical record, right? And I will always, always say, when you don't know the answer to a question, read your record. I don't care if it doesn't answer the question, but read your record. The only thing that matters here is your record. So if they say, what color is the sky? And you say, on this day, he presented his blood pressure was 120 over 80. That's fine, because what are you going to do when you read that record? You're going to feel confident. You know this. This is what you know. This is what you gravitate towards. You're going to start feeling relaxed. But if that medical record is crap, you won't feel relaxed, right? 
if you haven't documented correctly, you won't be able to get that kind of like feeling where all right, I'm grounded, I'm home, right? So again, these are all tools, but what in doubt, just document and document that. And you know what else you can do? All right, go back. All right, you can ask your supervisor. These people are awesome, right? They know information on clinical information and they can tell you how to document, like they can help you, right? They can help you. What I don't want you to do is go in, write a note, then go check with them and then change your note, right? Because every period, every, you know, every single word in that medical record is tracked by metadata. So um, if you need to hold off and write it a note, don't hold off too long, but you can, you can talk and then you can write your note. Another thing I've seen a lot of people do is they open a Word document, they type up their note in Word, they might change some words here and there, they copy and paste that into a medical record. When you do that, open up the medical record, paste that in, wait some time, and then close out of it, right? You don't want to open it and close it within the same millisecond because then obviously it looks like you did it in a Word document, right? So that, the metadata tracks absolutely everything you do. And then delete the Word document that you wrote about it, right? But there's, you know, there's all these ways and I'm willing to work through them all. If you have any questions, you can ask me. The only thing is I ask, if you ask me, do not put in your medical record, pursue it, demand being legal, right? That's really bad. Don't, don't do that because I, Again, yeah, have no idea how to care for anyone. I think I know what a high blood pressure is, but I actually don't. And the reality is my, again, my duty of care, I don't have one, right? I have no duty of care to the patient. My duty, again, to the hospital, very, very, very good things. You guys are caring for a patient and I get, you know, I'm caring for the hospital. So we do these awesome focus assessments, right? So you have someone come in and they're complaining of weakness and you're going to go through and you're going to talk to the patient and you're going to go through these kind of, Checkpoints, right? And each of these tell you information, right? If you have someone complaining of weakness and they're going to tell you this information, it's important for you, right? And this helps you kind of think about certain things. It helps the clinician who looks at this, the doctor, think of certain things, right? You're always running through these differential diagnoses in your mind, right? So you're trying to focus the assessment. What part of this do you guys feel is the most important part? All of it. Oh, okay. including the comment section. And I am a firm believer. Do you ever leave it blank? I do. Yeah? Yeah. How often? Um, I don't know. But I feel like if I answered on a click and sometimes you just write another note in addition to that. So I don't like to double document. Okay. So if I put, you know, in my note per the wife, then... I feel like I don't need to put it in here. Okay, that's fair. You know. So if you go all the way down and you add, add no. So, okay, so that's, that was a poor question on my part. Do you ever not add comment if you um, have a no? Wait, say that again? So when you go on the bottom and you click add no, yeah. you do that in every case every time? No. Okay, how often do you do it? Uh, when I feel like I don't have... Like it doesn't really paint a picture with the clicks. Okay. And so there's, so for every assessment, there's a place to add a note to that assessment, but then we have a, like another area to just write general notes. You would never not do any of it? No. Okay, so you're always putting some narrative yeah, in somewhere. something, yeah. How about you guys? I think every case should have some narrative somewhere. I'm a huge proponent. Why? It actually shows that besides the clicking, there's a thought process, right? Now, I know you guys are busy, and I'm not naive to the fact that you guys are dealing with the schedule most people would try it once. I would, I would try it forward. I would need my Google, right? <laughs> so um, all I'm asking you to do is once you get into this customer practice and doing it, it becomes a lot, a lot easier um, to do. And, you know, when I'm looking at this, as I say, you know, a lot of times I give this example. Um, I'm sorry if you've heard this now, but um, recently I was in the emergency department with my dad, right? And my dad is 77 years old, but not like an old 77 year old. Like he runs 10 miles every night. I'm just trying out. He has a chart where he will like put his time and everything like that. Kate has that chart. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think he's <laughs> Yeah, he's like incredible. Um, and and you know, he doesn't stop. And that's part of his culture. And he just thinks, how you doing? I'm fine. Right? He doesn't like let people know. So he goes over in the house and he was not walking straight, right? He was like kind of like walking off, which was weird. And then he tripped, right? Like 
stumbled because I was like, hey, you all right? You need to sit down? He's like, yeah, which like has never happened in my life ever. So I was like, all right, you want like, why don't you sit down? I'm not immediately thinking, oh my God, he's having a stroke. Oh my God, like what's going on? And I say, do you want to go to the emergency room? And he said, yes. So I'm like, oh my God, he's going to die. Like, this is it. Like, I'm not going to like be able. So I'm calling my sister, like, oh my God, daddy's going to the hospital. I'm really, really worried. She's the boss. And I'm like, you have to come down, right? I'm like immediately overreacting on my daughter. So um, we take him in. He sits down. The nice doctor says, how you doing? And he's like, I'm fine. But I say, no, he's not. You have to look at everything. It's carotid artery. You've had a stroke. What is going on? <laughs> but, and I would expect there where it says complaint comment, it would be her daughter. It could even say, no, I shouldn't say overreact. But you know what I mean? Like you're gonna, you're gonna say like, who is communicating this, right? Patient sitting in no acute distress, daughter adamant that father having a stroke, right? However you wanna say it, because that's important. Right, it's important information that you're getting, and there's no click for that. There's no overrate every daughter. Okay? <laughs> um, but again, it 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 does it provides information. So the idea of who provides you with information, what did you see? Right, your objective findings. You know, when you attention order number seven, emergency room. Attention order number seven, emergency room. Attention order number seven, emergency room. Does that mean like waiting area? Like, no, usually it's in the first area. It could be anywhere. It yeah. could be anywhere, but I have a story. Um, so this is, you know, the vitals are taken in who was communicated with, right? Like you can imagine a situation where you go in to a patient, and these are what kind of patients you guys see in the emergency room? All kinds of But emergent, right? The idea that people go there. I know, I know, I know. There's overuse of the emergency department, and we know this, and we think that um during COVID, I think people learned this. I don't doubt, though, that people easily forget, right? Because especially in our community, I think people see the emergency department sometimes as an urgent care, right? You have um, community members who don't either don't have their um, a primary care physician um, that they see routinely, or they don't have the ability to go to their primary care physician during the work hours, um, and they overuse the emergency department. There's no doubt about that. There's also um, no doubt that those individuals sometimes don't be sicker than someone who does have a routine um, with their uh, primary care. So you're gonna have these uh, individuals coming and you might have a patient who's, who's skanking, right? And you know immediately you're doing their vitals. I need to communicate this with someone. This is really important, right? And you do, and you write in the medical record, MD aware. What does that tell me, MD aware? Which doctor? What did you make them aware of? That it's a Tuesday? <laughs> Obviously not. You told him that, you know, this patient, you know, X, Y, and Z, talking about that, right? Why do you want to do that? Because when you're sitting and you're sworn to give testimony under oath, you will be asked, what did you tell the doctor? And you will have absolutely no doubt in your mind what you told the doctor, right? And then who? I will tell you right now, there are three active cases right now where it says MD made aware, MD co-defendant in the case. You know what the MDs are saying? Uh, I wasn't told. They're not Griffin employees anymore. They're usually residents, right? They're gonna go far away by the time the case is in suit. They are no longer here. They do not care. You know what they care about? Whether or not they're gonna get tagged in the case. And you know the easiest thing for them to do is? I don't know. They most likely don't remember because they don't have a note, right? So they probably don't remember, but then it's, they don't have a note and you have a note that you told someone, but it's not there, you know? So that's why it's always, always important. I'm not saying to blame them. I'm not saying we have to arrest them. I'm just saying, did you talk to that doctor? Yes. Documented name. Is that accurate? Is that factual? Yeah. So sometimes the information, the observation, and the objective findings, sometimes we don't get that in the checkbox. So what I'm saying is when you're being deposed and all you have is check marks, it's not really helpful. A good documentation is legitimately the only way that you can deter lawsuits. You can sue anyone for anything at any time. Um, that's the standard. In a lawsuit for medical malpractice, you have to find an expert witness who is a similar healthcare provider under a statute that was amended in 2005. It's 52190A. If you guys want to look it up, it's really not interesting at all. But the idea behind the state of Connecticut uh, mandate at the time was we had a mass exodus of physicians and clinicians and nurses from the state of Connecticut. Right, it was just no insurance company was willing to write insurance in the state of Connecticut for providers. That's why we have all these captives, right? 
no one was willing to write because the malpractice verdicts were through the roof and the number of malpractice cases was high, right? So they said, all right, before you sue any clinicians, you have to have a letter called a good faith opinion letter from a similar healthcare provider saying that there's evidence of negligence, right? Evidence of negligence is as easy as saying there's a rock on the floor. It does not take a lot to say there's evidence of negligence because there can always be evidence of negligence, right? You can look at anything medical record and find evidence of negligence. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not, you know, to a reasonable degree of medical probability. It's evidence of negligence. It's very, very easy to meet that, okay? That's why we don't have any tort reform. The 2005 legislation was crap. But that is the standard that we're dealt with today. So when you're looking at a medical record, the, you have to think, is someone going to be looking at this record to find quote unquote evidence of negligence? How can I just like, how can I de deter them from seeing that, right? If you just have check marks and it, you know, you're not going to have that. I know you guys go in to see a patient more than once in your place, right? You're in there a lot. I ask you every time you go in there, have some sort of, right? Just that you were in and they were alive, not like that. But you know that, how am I able to say, I went in there, I had a case, it was McClellan versus Baptist Hospital, I'll never forget it. The nurse was in practice at least 25 years, okay? It was uh, an individual, and this is important for the story, I'm not just saying this to like, you know, make fun of the individual. The individual had just been released from jail. On Tuesday, this is a Friday night, he um, jumped from the edge of a parking garage down a flight of 12 stairs, fell and broke his leg, right? He was very high at the time and, and um, under the influence of alcohol and some narcotics. The police in their incident, in their uh, report, called him Peter Pan because he thought he could fly. He was that high. They took him to Baptist Hospital, not, not a trauma center. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Baptist Hospital, but it's not a trauma center. He had an obvious broken leg. When he hit the floor, he also dislocated his knee. When somehow he hit the floor, the knee was not obviously dislocated when they saw him, but he obviously had a break but the knee did not look dislocated. They did an x-ray. The x-ray did not appreciate the fact that behind that the popliteal artery, when the knee dislocated, they also severed the artery, right? The nurse would go in the room. She said, you know, every like probably 30 minutes, she was going in, she would put her feet on the patient's feet. I mean, her hands on the patient's feet, sorry. Because that was her custom and practice to check for pulses. She said she did it every time she went in the room. She went in the room, she would put her fingers on his feet, she would talk to him, see how you're doing, she'd do her vitals, and that, that's how she did her assessment. There were pulses present. I know that sounds strange because you had a severed popliteal artery. How can that be? I had four experts retained. They told me you would have that with the amount of everything that was in his body. He had that perfusion, right? He had that perfusion for some time. There would be perfusion. You would feel those pulses. At some point, though, the pulses stopped, and he had a compartment syndrome. In that case, ended up with him having a um, above the knee amputation um, and a lawsuit, right? That nurse was amazing. She was a really, really, she was a great witness. I would have loved her in a million cases. You know, she was a really, really bad person at documenting. You know how many notes she had over an eight hour span? One. That's it, one. Charted by exception, but no point in that nurse, in that um, note did it say positive pulse. She's like, of course I didn't write it. It wasn't an exception. It's obvious that you have them, you know, right, right? What I would have loved in that case and how that case would have been defensible from my point of view, every time she walked in that room, she had some sort of note. She had something in there that says, I put my hands on his feet, close his presence. It's like the fact that he has his broken leg, right? No one thought he had a um, popular artery. Obviously, the uh, radiologist who looked at the X ray didn't think he had it, right? The text that bought him into the operating room didn't think he had it. The ER doc didn't think he had it, right? But it all essentially fell on her because she had the task of making sure they were pulses. She never documented that they were absent, right? I don't want that to be you because that's a very, you could see that happening, right? You could see kind of how that would unfold. Why would she say there were pulses present when she's charted by exception? We've had some cases with um, a ubiquitous ulcer present. Pressure injury. Pressure injury, thank you. New word, yes. Um, <laughs> oh, they're not dead. <laughs> I, I appreciate that because I stutter over that word constantly. <laughs> um, not present on admission, right? It's reportable to the state. 
things that you transfer from our part. Also, cases are um, when I when this is being recorded, it's not like going to be recorded and like shared. Um, but within the nursing, within the nursing staff, yeah, they're worth a lot of money. I wouldn't want anyone to like say that I like conceded that they're worth a lot of money. Why are they worth a lot of money? Because there's always leads in that case, right? There's Medicare lead because usually they are living at a skilled nursing facility. The state pays itself back first from any verdict. So those cases start at a value of $300,000. Okay. Why? Because zero is now 300. And then who takes second? The attorney. So those cases have a high value. They're quote unquote worth money. So they are going to be brought over and over and over again until we have some sort of reform as to means and who pays means and where they come from. Documentation in those sort of lawsuits is so important. I cannot in a million years express the importance of a single notation of possible redness. I, I, I mean, there's a million things you guys see. You're like, eh, now that looks fine, right? If you're, eh, if you're there, if you're like, yeah, document it. Why? If you don't document it, it was never there. Right? If it's not in the medical record, it didn't happen. Right? So if you didn't document that you may have saw something, you saw nothing. Right? And immediately this now becomes an injury that wasn't pressure on admitted. So it's just really, really important to document. Does anyone have any questions? Am I like asking like something that's like just impossible? No? Would you tell me though? Like if I like start to get like a little crazy here? <laughs> so what else is the medical record? It's not your mind, right? It's not where you go to express your feelings or your opinions. It's not important. It's not that I don't care. I care. I very, very much care. I would rather you pick up the phone, tell me all your feelings, and then chart facts and accurate information, right? Why? Because when you start charting your feelings and your opinions, it's the Bible. That medical record is the end all and the be all. It is a snapshot in time. So your, your frustrations and your opinions, it's no longer an opinion, it's a diagnosis. And I know what you're saying, you're saying, I'm a nurse, I don't make diagnoses. No, you do if you've documented it in your medical record. I think that the, um, I think that the delay in providing the medication has caused this patient to become septic. That's an opinion. And now you have given the opinion as to why the patient is septic. Not the patient came in septic. But you've said, yeah, it's the delay in giving medication, right? And you might think that, and you might be really, really mad. So what's available to you? What tools are available to you to take, to, to deal with that? When you think that there has been a mistake or there's a delay for patient care, or you're trying to get in touch with the doctor and the doctor's not calling you back. You go to the medical record and say, call them deep, call them again. For the love of God, you won't answer me. <laughs> what do you do? Does this help the patient? We have like the instant recording, like we used to call RL. Mm -hmm. Does that solve the problem? Not immediately, but in theory it should be easier. What about immediate in the immediate term? You have a patient and the doctor's not responding to text messages. But how do you get the doctor to the bedside? You are You have the chain of command. Go up, go up, keep going up, keep going up until you get someone. We have a great chain of command, I think. Um, our hospital actually has the CEO at the end of that chain. Go on every single hospital that has their policies online. I guarantee you. I think that is like pretty telling. I mean, you might believe it, you might buy into it, you might not. But at this hospital, they, if you can't get to anyone, you can actually get to the CEO. Yeah. You can buy it, you can buy not, but however it is, you have chain of command. So when you're documenting your medical record, MD made aware, MD order still pending, MD still not here, no one's paying attention to my concerns. And you sit at the deposition and you're like, I, you know what, I did everything right, I did everything right, and I told 700 people about this patient. Attention, order number seven, all clear. Attention, order number seven, all clear. Attention, order number seven, all clear. Here is how that testimony will go, okay? Have you seen this document before? Yes. 
Can you tell me what this is? This is my nursing note from January 1st, 2016. And what did you write? I wrote MD made aware, MD did not respond, MD made aware again, pending, order still pending. I did everything I was supposed to do. I tried to get a doctor there. All right, well, who did you tell? MD, who? The doctor, right? And they're gonna show me testimony and says the MD did not know. I'm gonna say, no, no, he knew I said MD made aware. And then they're gonna say, all right, well, what else did you do? No, I told him four times. And then I took it out on the medical. And they're gonna ask this. <laughs> They're going to ask the following question. Was there more you could have done? And that's like the kiss of death, right? Whenever that question is asked at a deposition, I hold my breath and I say a Hail Mary, okay? Because why? Is there anything more you should have done? In a case where providers have actually done what they're supposed to do, the answer to that question is always no, right? But in a case where a nurse has taken things out in the medical record or a doctor has taken their feelings out in the medical record, and not done all the things they could have done. The answer to that question is always yes, right? So you can prep a witness all they want, but the other side, guess what they know of the champion, right? So they're gonna say, okay, are you aware of the hospital? And then they'll whip it out and they'll put a sticker on it and now it's an exhibit. And they'll say, all right, were you aware of this? Yeah. Can you show me where in the medical record it shows? So they don't care what you actually did, right? Can you show me where in the medical record it shows that you followed your hospital's own policy? And now you're like, as an attorney, we're denying because it's not the standard of care that we have to follow with our own policy. And our policies, we go above and beyond the standard of care, like consistently throughout, we go above and beyond. This is a conversation for another day. But now you're not only obligated to follow the standard of care, you're obligated to follow our own hospital policy. So did you do X, Y, and Z? And if you did, where in the medical record did you do it? Because remember, it's not in the medical record. It did not. So feelings, not good. Opinions, they're great, but everyone has them. Do you ever hear that? All right, so here's how I want you to document in the medical record. I want you to be excellent, because you are excellent, right? You are already excellent. I want you to hear Nancy. I don't need to be excellent. I am excellent, right? And here's how you can show that in the medical record. State the facts, what you saw, what you heard, what you did. I know I did that. How do you know? I wrote it down. Show me where in the medical record, if you turn to page 45, halfway through where you sit, that's where I did it. It's like a virtual middle finger, <laughs> right? Chart after each visit. Because I don't care if you went in there 15 times, if you met and go in the record, and you only have one assessment, you went in there once. I can have video of you going in and out of the room like a ping pong ball. But you know what matters? The medical record. If it's not a medical record, it did not happen. I used to have a boss that said that repeatedly, but she said it with this. If it's not in the medical record, it didn't happen. It would give me nightmares. I still have nightmares over, <laughs> over that, right? Because no matter what theory I came up with, I would like work my opening statement around or whatever. She would say, she'd sit there like this. Yeah. All right. Show me in the medical <laughs> record where it says that. And I would like say, well, the testimony of, yeah, if it's not in the medical record, it didn't have the jury's not going to believe you. They're just not. <laughs> right? And part of being a trial attorney is I need to get the jury to believe every word that comes out of my mouth. I will start an opening and I will say, my name is Nancy Marini. I will be Dr. So-and-so's voice in this courtroom. Because what am I trying to do? I'm trying to get the jury to associate me with that doctor, me with that hospital, that hospital that's just a building that they know has an insurance policy, right? How am I going to do that? Every word that comes out of my mouth, I need them to believe. So when I say on this date, at this time, this was done, I want a medical record that I that that's me you can't argue, right? So chart after each visit, note the response, right? Why, why is that important? Now that's not as important as number one and number two, but if you're considering it, right? You consider responses. Describe observation, right? We, also, we often have, we often hear like, hey, the clinical picture or the objective you know, picture is different than the subjective picture, right? So you're gonna have every single case, every single time, the patient's testimony at that time when now they're a plaintiff, 10 out of 10. I was, I'm paying 10 out of 10 and no one, everyone was ignoring me, 
right? So you have a patient saying the pain cannot get, and that's subjective, right? That's what they are reporting to you. But you see them on the phone and they're laughing. You see things that maybe go on to, right? Patient reporting pain 10 out of 10, patient observed on phone and no physical stress. Is it factual? Yeah. Did you see it with your own eyes? Yes. Now, if another nurse says, yeah, he said he's in pain, but I saw him on the phone, don't document that. That's not what something you saw, right? That's just now we're getting into like layered hearsay, which is like not good. Um, and never speculate, right? Chart what the patient is literally saying. I get mad that I kids for using the word literally. I was literally so cold. I was, I'm like, <laughs> like one of those pesky. Here I am telling you, literally saying, what are the words that are coming out of their mouth? Use quotations, okay? And then every time you see quotation marks, you know who told you that. That's not me saying this. That is the patient saying this. Bless you, bless you. This is the crazy daughter saying this. The father needed his, his um, drug artery looked at because he was having a stroke. And like, it's okay to chart swears. Like if they say, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> when the patient is using colorful language, what is that pain? A snapshot in time, right? So five years from now, you have provided me with an oil remnant painting, Rembrandt, Rembrandt <laughs> painting of a very heated conversation. Because you know, at trial, the patient is dressed up very nicely with pearls. <laughs> I would never present in a manner where I was speaking down to the nurses. I was doing everything they asked me to do. <laughs> right? You guys get sworn at, you get spit at, you get yelled at, you are demeaned. Yes? Okay. Now, am I asking you to give your opinion and or your feelings as to how that encounter made you feel? No. But did it happen? Yes. Patient tells me to get the F out of their room. How can you take the vital signs of someone telling you to get the F out of their room? So when there's a complaint and it says that the hospital failed to timely administer care, right? That's my favorite thing, failed to timely administer care. Failed to properly treat and assess. How can you properly treat and assess someone in timely administer care for telling you to get the F out of their room, right? And I have a slide on this. How are you supposed to deal with that, right? Patient told me to get the F out of their room. Patient states, get the F out of my room. What did you do? You just go, all right. Oh, you don't do that. You are good care providers. You do what? What do you do when a patient tells you to get the F out of their room? Sorry. Sir, I really need to take your vitals. I can give you a minute and I can return. When I return, I'm going to ask that you please let me administer care. And you leave. You give them a minute and you come back. Sir, can I take your vitals? Get the F out of here. I want to see the CEO. Okay. I'm going to get my nursing supervisor. Was it another nurse? Gonna, we really need to take your vitals. I'm going to try. Patient. Now you've documented, you made an attempt, what they said, returned, advised patient, attempted de-escalation measures. I love that. Attempted de-escalation. Oh, that's like beautiful. It's Christmas morning for an attorney. <laughs> Tell me what those are. Oh my God. It's like you celebrate Christmas and Hanukkah. All right. It's beautiful. Why? Is it accurate? Yeah. Is it the truth? It sure the heck is. That's what you did. Is there a check box for that? No. Is it an exception? Yeah. So you're still charting by exception. You need a narrative sometimes to do. So I love quotes. I love them. I will never say. And people are like, oh, but 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 the um oh, here. I'll go. Oh, ahead. I'll go to the next one. All right, thank you.
maybe. Oh, oh, oh sorry about that. Too much. It's still going to be oh. All right. Okay. So I'm going to talk about this now. Patient still pending an initial down by the provider, mother getting upset, saying she's going to leave soon and go to Yale, charge also aware. If this is your note, I can pick apart every single note. If there will be a beautiful note, I will still pick it apart. So if this is your note or anyone out there, if this is your note, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay? Don't take this personal. All right? These are just some notes. All right? What do we think of this? Is there anything you would change? I guess you should have the name of who made aware, right? So it starts to be identified. Charge. Provider, maybe who's been assigned. Do you are you guys um, in any really are you guys in a relationship with somebody significant other? Did you ever get into an argument where someone was to take the trash out? And you walk by the trash and you say, the garbage is still there. Still and the garbage is still there. You are pissed off, you are passive aggressive, right? Patient still pending initial evaluation. What does it this tell you? What you did about it. I mean, doesn't it also doesn't tell me? I mean, so I'm reading this question, this this now, right? And putting aside the, the assessment, right? Is this child dying? Right? I mean, what is this? Is I mean, this is some a child in RED. I'm assuming a child in RED, right? Someone under the age of 16 and I'm, I'm on an emergency. Not necessarily a lot of 30 year olds going with their mom. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, see, I'm not gonna laugh at that. You know why? Because when my kid's 30, you can pretty much I would have, I would probably also, yeah, see, I'm not gonna laugh, but. I'm going to try. I'm going to learn from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so patients still pending initial eval by provider. Mother getting upset. What does the mother say? Why? Why is it so important that he be seen right now? The patient's leg is severed off. My kid has a sliver. She's worried about infection from a sliver. Makes sense. Makes sense. Did you reassure the, the mom? Or did you say, Mammy, I'm going to something? No, I'm sure you said to the mother, You're concerned. I understand. The doctor was made aware. You will be seen. Did that happen? Yes. I guarantee you guys aren't just walking in and having the mother yell at you and walking out. And I know, too bad. Go to the yell. Right? Or did you say, you know what? This looks like something we might not be able to treat here. Also, okay, right? But I assume if the patient is here, it's something we can treat. Charge also aware. Who is the charge? Also aware. Again, still trash is still there. <laughs> also aware, right? This person is annoyed. And you know what an attorney's gonna do when they see this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to get this person to sit down. They're going to tell me all their feelings. And I'm going to say, and what else did you do? Could you have done more? Yes. Right? Pretty insignificant note when you first look at it. But now you have these tools. You're going to say, how would I have charted this? Right? I'm going to chart this with patient presented to ED at whatever time they presented. The doctor who's assigned, right? Dr. Smith assigned. What time is this? At 2.12 p.m. Mother noted, whatever. Mother uh, stated, you better see my patient, my, my child now, I'm getting really nervous, right? That's not a huge like thing, but that's what she says. So you're gonna quote that. Advise Dr. Smith that mother is anxious. Also advise charge nurse Jody, right? Same thing you're community, you're providing a snapshot in time. But you're actually telling someone what you saw, what you heard, and what you did. And then let's say 10 minutes pass and you still don't have the provider and the charge hasn't gone in there. Because right, the charge, if the charge was in there, the charge will write something, right? The charge will have her own note, right? His own note. 
So the medical record is providing an information, providing a snapshot on something. Patient requested nickname patch. MD made aware and patch administered per request. Patient calm and cooperative at this time. What does this sound? Well, it tells you how the patient is. I mean, it doesn't just, it doesn't say who, what MD was aware. It doesn't say what MD, I love this. Patient calm, right? Because we talked about the importance of documenting your response, right? Patient requested nickname patch, MD made aware and patch administered per request. Who's request? Was it because the doctor believed it was ordered or is he just trying to placate the patient? Do we know? Do we know why the nickname patch was even requested? Is it someone who has anxiety issues? Is it someone who needs to go outside and have a cigarette? Is it someone we're saying can't go outside? Like, what is it? We don't know, right? Just information. Again, these are snapshots. I'm not saying these are anything. All right. What say you? You guys be the jury, okay? Skin check done and with the assistant with the assistance of Jetmara P. Skin is warm, dry, and intact, with the exception of coxoxic, uh, coxoxic, uh, <laughs> and right glute pole. In toxic area, there are two small slits. 0.05 centimeters and one centimeter with a PC of packing protruding from each area. This was found and covered by Telfa FB teg Tegaderm. Patient states, patient states and bandage shows it was changed today. However, patient could not explain what it was from. In the right little bone, there are four surgical cords, which the patient states are from a previous old abscess surgery he had here at Griffin. Patient was given one unit of blood in the ED, which appears to have been ended correctly in the tar, and one unit here on the floor. Dr. Awad stated to hold off on the 1600 blood draw as it was still running, as the second unit was still running, and he would verify before leaving tonight if draw could wait until morning. If this is your note, I'm gonna turn around, just say yes. I won't know who it is, even on the interweb. Is it your note? No, it's not. It's an inpatient. Okay. <laughs> All right. One more time. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I took this note. <laughs> Say it again. Right. Listen. I love. The first and second line. Why do I love the first and second line? I love the first one. We have measurements, we have information, what was done, we have what the patient states. I mean, I would have put something in more in quotation marks, but the patient could not explain what it was from. But that doesn't mean it's the last line. That yeah, the we're gonna go sticker. here. Yeah. I would have loved like something here where um it said like something like, but can't be sure. Right, like, hey, we have this like four surgeries, but we don't know, right? This is what the patient said, you know, you're not sure. But this line, you might as well have a divorce proceeding. You might as well be watching a telenovela. Seriously, what this is telling me is someone didn't do their job down there, and actually, I don't even trust the doctor. No one's gonna do their job for this patient, right? What should have been done if you actually believe that something wasn't entered correctly in the chart? Is it documented in a parenthetical? It's like the most passive aggressive thing you do. You should pick up the phone, call down and say, hey, how you doing? Weather's nice today. It's good, yeah. Hey, do me there. Can you go into this chart? Can you look here? And can you close it out? Awesome, thanks, talk to you later. Right? This is like, what has this person done for the patient? What more could have been done? Could you have done more? Yes. And then this, after it was stated to hold off, she didn't believe that he would do it. She didn't believe he was actually going to do it, and she put it in the medical record so she could be like, eh, he told me I didn't do anything else. Right? Isn't that something that would be communicated during your handoff to the patient? Like, hey, can you, we're going to do this, this is the plan. And this, so that's not something that gets documented. 
This came out back in 2012 with like Eat This, Not That. I actually bought the book. It didn't work well. I That's kind of my, um, I wanted to go through these like an idea, right? This is how people are writing this. And this is kind of how I'm looking at it. Again, non-clinically, right? I defer to you guys. All right, I'm going to defer. I give you tools, you do your thing, right? I buy you uh, tools, you build me a house. Okay, I don't build houses. I try. So when I'm giving you a lot of this stuff, I want you, I want to hear from you how you would write it, what you think, right? So patient non-compliant, we see all the time. It's true, but patient non-compliant with what? Right? Their medication. They were supposed to lose weight. Like, what is it that they're non-compliant with? Say what they're not compliant with, right? And then what you said in response. Did you say you should take your blood pressure medication? Right? Every single patient leaves the ED. Patient that don't, what do you tell the patient? Every patient, every time. What do you say? If you feel sick, if you get worse, if your pain continues, what? Come back. Right? Come back to us. And then we have the patient who three days later. You know, unfortunately, suffers in that and passes away, and the family will say, "We didn't know he was just like that." But it's in the discharge instructions. Nah, 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 nah. You sign them, and nah, nah, no one feels us. Right? I know you say that to the patient. Is that double charging? Yeah, I don't care. It's really important. If you have a conversation where you're like, hmm, "If you continue to feel bad or worse, come back," patient reminded to come back if they feel worse. It takes twenty seconds. You can, guys. You can. Do it. You can talk to Sharon Rashad, get you guys a control 17 and that automatically pop up. I don't care. But if you have that conversation, document it. Because if it's not in the medical record, it didn't happen. Patient screamed at this nurse and threatened to the hospital. But it was not a thing. What does that tell me? You patient yell at you and you walk out. Is that ever what happens? No. Patient presented, agitated, and threatening. Is that true? Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah. Did you hear it? Yeah. The escalation undertaking with no success. You want to make that better? Tell me what you did. Patient advised that you would not be able to conduct an assessment. And again, attempted to de-escalate the situation. The nurse again attempted to take the patient's vital signs. No success. You saw this same patient do this with somebody else. That's not an opinion. You saw it. I saw this happen. So you've got your ED, your ED nursing supervisor. She comes in and she's going to have her own note. Oh my God, twice in one record, yes. And you go back. And now you have the doctor at the bedside. This shows me, did you do everything you could do for this patient? Yes. What were you supposed to do? I was supposed to get my nursing supervisor. Did you do it? Yep, see, I did it. What happened when that was unsuccessful? We got the doctor involved. Did you do it? Yeah, mm -hmm, right here. You were not going to tell me I failed to assess someone. You're not going to tell me I failed to properly treat someone. I did. And I can tell you, and I can show you. Physician delayed in ordering medication. Physician inattended to this nurse's complaint. You see that, right? When you guys are advocating for your patient and the doctor is armed. It's frustrating. And I get the first thing you want to do is document the crap out of that medical kind of record. Because I see the problem and they don't. Does that fix it? No. This is like a tale of the oldest time. I mean, I hate to quote this later, but it's true. MD <laughs> versus RN. No matter what hospital you go to, you're out, right? And I've had the unfortunate um experience of representing a doctor when this was happening and i've represented hospitals when this is happening and guess what 90 percent of the time if you are a nurse employed by the hospital you represent both the hospital and the nurse and the doctor right and you know it's impossible to deal with he's competing it wasn't me it was them it wasn't them it was me you know what the jury thinks i don't care whose fault it was but obviously it was one of them you can't defend that right so my job is to somehow get everyone to realize that you're a king. Rise and fall together, right? If they're not listening to you, if the doctors are not listening to you, go up the chain. At some point, right? Someone listens to you. I'm confident. I am confident by that. Now, 
my IB Pollyannish and all this. Oh my God, two Disney references in there for me. <laughs> and like, be like, all like, no, it's like rainbows and sunshine and happiness. Possibly, you know what? When you say something, you know, when you go up and say, no one is paying attention to this, this patient's going to die, we're going to get sued. People will start paying attention. Yeah, so I want you to do that in the IRL and I want you to have that kind of conversation like back and forth. But with someone still, no one listens to you or whatever happens, Go to the IRL, right? Once you've gone up that chain and you got to the end of the chain and you got to the CEO, right? Once and the patient is now cared for. Now you're going to in and you're doing your report. I want you to do it. Listen, the more reports you guys give, the better. I have no problem with looking at the investigation. Someone is hired and paid for at this hospital to look at all of them. And when I get sent them, I read every single one. At least I try to because the system itself sucks. All right. But I try to read every single single one. And I love when people just give me facts. This is patient. This was the time the medication was ordered. This was the time it was administered, right? Is there a delay? Is there what's going on? But I, that's you're giving me the facts, right? Because when it's they're painting with all this telenovela stuff, your point gets lost in the drama. That's a question. Shoot, can you like if you were defending somebody, could you pull that RL and use that in court? So. Yeah, like like I wrote up this huge long thing about the issue with the doctor in the RL and now it's in your hands, but now I'm deposed and you're defending me. Can you pull that RL that I wrote saying everything that I So the RLs saying? technically quote unquote are peer reviewed. Peer reviewed documents are considered um, privileged. We would not want to start disclosing those. Okay, because if you disclose it in one, you just now that's it. That's the rule in the end all and be all you're gonna disclose them in every single case. Think about all the RLs that you've put in over the course of your career. Would you want them all for public view? No. So no. It's going to help my case, yes. <laughs> it's going to help your case against the doctor who's also employed by the hospital? What more could have been done for that patient? You told the doctor. You told one doctor. And then what did you do? That doctor was unreceptive to your concerns, yes. You knew the doctor should have been paying more attention, yes. So what did you do about it? What about the sire? Beautiful, beautiful report here. Did it help the patient to get the care that treatment they needed within the time of treatment, the time that they needed it, right? And I think that that's like part again, listen, I get it. I'm not, it's frustrating. I'm, I don't even know how frustrating it is, but I can understand it's frustrating. You are doing amazing things in emergent situations, emergency department, emergency. I don't do well in emergency situations. I like to have things planned out in advance. One of my favorite parts about my job, one of my least favorite parts about this new job, I could tell you what my schedule would look like 12 months in advance. I have a trial in September, I have a trial in October, I will have a trial in July and August. I will put depositions here. I can do some hearings here. I will take a vacation here. 12 months in advance, right? You guys don't have that luxury. You are dealing with things immediately and you need people to pay attention to you now. Writing that in a report is important for what you're trying to do to address it. I don't want this to happen again, but not important if you want to address it now with regards to this patient. That is where you go off the chain. So does it come out at a deposition? Absolutely not. Because any attorney work they're waiting for is going to say F no. Because everything in that document will be construed in a way that works out. And I have taken the position, and Lisa, who was here before me, has taken the correct position. Those are peer reviewed and you can't take the A good attorney won't even go over that with you in your deposition. Why? Because I need to review in connection with the deposition is discoverable. So they might read it to you because our communications are privileged, but if you put eyes on a document and reviewed it in connection with the deposition or testimony, it's no wonder privilege. And you'll sit there and you'll say, I know I wrote a report and I outlined everything that I did for this patient. That should be in the record, right? What's the point of the record? Snapshot in time. So if that information is only contained in the IRL, it's not in the medical record and then shouldn't happen. Here's a bad use of force. So 
This is actually from Basil. Uh, called ER. Call the R to Dr. Cam. Oh, can you read that? Yeah, F1 that we talked about. I am. Um... Oh my God, how does it need to be? Oh, Dr. Kim said that is fine. Right, Jackie. So, this was a whole thing they were, the nurses were concerned, the doctor didn't care. It was an uh, infectious disease doc. Doc said that's fine. That's fine. And they put it in quotes. You know why? They're being passive aggressive. Anytime you're quoting your colleagues, you're being passive aggressive, right? When you quote a patient, you're providing information. When you're quoting your colleagues, what are you telling the plaintiff's attorney? I didn't believe what they said, but I'm documenting it with quotes. So you know it wasn't me who said it, it was them. What's the better thing to do when a doctor is not understanding what you're trying to say? Call the doctor on the phone, look at them in the face, go up that chain of command. They're not understanding what I'm trying to communicate. They're saying it's fine, the patient is dying, right? Is that unreasonable for me to ask you to continue to do? Yeah, I don't get it. It's a lot of time and a lot of effort. And again, it's case by case basis and things like that. But what I'm asking you is if you're documenting in the medical record that someone's not paying attention to you, instead of documenting it in the medical record, I'm asking you to get someone to pay attention to you. How do you feel about that? I think it depends, and I get where Heather's asking this, so it depends. You're, you're wanting to cover the hospital scene, like ask, mm -hmm. better word, and we're trying to cover ours. Absolutely. So, like, if we're following the chain of command, and now Emily, Gonka, or Kate, Heather's gone to Emily, who's, who's in charge, and Emily comes to me. Okay, we're not putting it in our L, but we've gone up our chain of command, and nothing's being done about it. It's more than how do you want us charting it to say we've, we've got up our chain of command, we've gone. Yeah, 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 no, and what part do you, would you guys switch over to the docs? It depends on what, what it's about. And you, so, and then if the docs aren't, like if they came to me, I'd go directly, like I wouldn't go to my boss unless there's something nurse or like I would go to Dr. Yeah. DeSouza, the head of the resident, resident or Dr. Brown. But then at that point, once I've escalated to them, I'm like waiting on them to give me. So it's like, I'm trying to cover them, but how do I write that in the chart without sounding like. So when you, when you went to Dr. Brown, this nurse communicated to Dr. Brown the following symptoms. And what, what, what did you tell Dr. Brown, right? I told Dr. Brown this patient is presenting with the following symptoms, right? And then what do you do after you do that? No, I'm not dying. What do you do after you tell Dr. Brown this patient is dying and no one's paying attention? Depends what he, what he says. So give me, give me like some scenario. It depends. Usually what the issue we have is with like residents. Like we're asking for meds or like our patients are complaining of pain. That's usually the number one thing. And we're calling, calling, but we're not, like we're, they're not responding. And we're not allowed to call rapids on patients that are admitted. We mm -hmm. have to use our ED attendants. So a lot of times our ED attendants will get involved, but like it's yeah. like they know nothing about the patient because they weren't the ones who admitted the patient. Right. So it's kind of like finding that common ground. Yes, we're very fortunate. It's not so much our doctors because our doctors are always there, so we don't have to gauge them, but it's more on admitted patients. It depends. Sometimes you get a response right away, and sometimes you might not because it's seven o'clock in the morning, you have no idea who's caring for that patient, right? And this is obviously a system breakdown that we need to address, right? And I'm happy that I know because I want to try to help you guys address that. That's a lot of frustration, right? That you know. And when you have it happen, you know it's gonna happen, right? You know at seven o'clock you have someone asking for payments, you're like, crap, I'm not gonna be able to help them for another two hours, right? And you already have that kind of like defensiveness um, to it. So um, how do you document that? I mean, I think there needs to be number one, a sit down between, you know. Doctors, you know, they're, they're, that needs to be addressed. I am 100% that needs to be addressed. Um, so, but how, like, let's talk about how you document that, right? Um, when you can't get in touch with the resident, who's in that group? The MLD. And then what happens? And if they don't answer, then the attending. And how long do you give each? But, well, that's the thing. We don't have like a written, we don't have it like, you know, if after 10 minutes or if we don't have the end, yeah. Like how, yeah. day, how quickly do I need this? So what I want you to do is I want you to document everyone that you're calling. I called this doctor, you know, I called the MOD doctor, whoever it is. And if you communicated some pretty egregious like symptomology, tell put, put that in the document. That's better than saying no one is paying attention to me because what you're doing is you're that is how you cover your behind. Right. Well, that's what I was trying to say. So it's fine to document inside those conversations. It's more just saying like I contacted Dr. Smith and made him aware of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I want, yeah, I want you. I'm not saying don't, oh my God, no, no. I want you to document that. Because did you do it? Yes. Did you communicate it? Yes. Right? That snapshot time. What did you see? What did you say? What did you do? 
I want you to document that, right? Things I'd like to avoid if possible. And if you write it, it's not the end of the universe. I'm just trying to give you some tools. That, instead of saying still pending, still waiting, right? I'm trying to give you the tools to kind of like how to address that. So document what you did, what you see, what you heard. And then what did you do after that? I didn't just sit here and wait two hours for a call back. I actually did this, this, and this. So that's how you cover your own ass. I did this, then I did this, and then I did this. So if you think something can happen here, it's him, her, or him. Don't look at me because when you're asked the question, what more could you have done? The answer is nothing. I did everything I could have possibly done. Right? When you're confident in that. So, and then if there's system issues, like I, I'm not being scanned for these actors, I didn't order. So yeah. And so like it. we can write like whatever, you know, attempt, you know, call Dr. Smith aware of temp 103, like awaiting new orders. Like, can we, is that all right? Awaiting new orders. That's good, right? You communicate. He says, I'm going to put some order in your time. Yeah. Awaiting new orders. And that still takes two hours for time order, but I'm still awaiting new orders. So after 20 minutes, who else are you calling? If anyone, right? I mean, I'm just using that like, yeah, like well, no, like if I talk to the intern and then I got off and I call the resident. Yeah. And then you can have that 15 times in the IRL. Just what exactly this is a, this is an example of me being unable to contact the doctor assigned to the patient, which has delayed medication administration. Is it factual? Yes. Are you getting an opinion? No, you're saying delay the admission of medication that you would have given two hours earlier if there was a freaking order for it. I'm a nurse and I can't give an order. So can you give me an order? Do we do verbal orders for my favor? No. No, no. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Right. Like that's what you're, you've documented it, right? That's how you cover your own book. Going up the chain. Going up the chain until you cannot go like up it no more. That is covering it. This, I always give a good example like when you know the person who's yelling or screaming or everything like that. People are like, they're nice. You guys are so nice. Don't be nice, right? I mean, I know patients can get their own medical records, and that's great. But you know what? Maybe they'll stop swearing at people. You know, when it says it in the medical record, like patients or stated, whatever, right? It's fine. Document it. If it's true, if it happened, document it. Yeah, don't say you spoke to me. In the medical record. It's just... <laughs> No. Don't say discuss care with MD. I'm serious. Three, three active cases right now with this hospital. So your death traps. Um, this isn't so much an issue anymore because of the electronic, but failure to date, time, and sign a medical entry. When you go back, when you did something at 10.30 in the morning and it's now 11.45, when did you do it? 11.45 or 10.30? Say at 11.30 because the medical record is interpreted as the time that you write your note was the time that you administered treatment. And you can kind of see if someone is like, you know, here and they're scared, give, you know, the timing of notes is like horrid, right? I can't even articulate how horrid it is unless people say not, you know, when earlier or, you know, half hour, whatever it is, document what time you back to everything. Remember, everything is meta, the metadata for everything. So if you back time this, you can go in and change the time that you were in there. Okay, so and then it starts at 10.30, but it says late, late entry, right? No, no, no. For us, it you we can change the time that that note is time stamped. Okay. It does when you print it, but if you go to court, they will still be able to see you back from your chart. Too. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So just double document and, and say at this time, this happens, even though you back time the notes to that time. Yeah, so when it, I, um, I can send you an example of how it looks when the official, unofficial, like the certified record is printed out. Because, you know, I mean, you don't always have a computer. It's not a computer. I mean, you, we, we documented it, like, after the fact. Hours later. Like, hours you know, like later. You a code. So, you know how when you do a code, even though you're entering it, let's say the patient died at 1030, but you're going back and you're starting mm -hmm. patient arrived at 934 in the evening and you do it like minute by minute. Mm -hmm. If you time stamp it with like your minute, even though it looks back time, you're still saying like at 9 30. I saw Emily walk in the room. Right? Notes documented after any event are remember, like Christmas and Hanukkah for me, it's Christmas and Hanukkah for 26 months. I just think it's probably misleading to the majority of the staff when they're allowed to choose the date and time of their note. Yeah, they're writing it. So that's something that actually really. 
Yeah. No, I mean, so we'll be able to see what time you did it and then what time you backtracked it. So, which again, is it what you did at that time? Yes. Is it accurate? Yes. Are you providing information? Yeah. But you're going to be asked the question, well, what more did you know when you wrote that note? When you wrote this note, you already knew that the patient expired. Yes? Yes. So they're like going to try to make it sound like when you wrote that note, you were writing it in a way that you were trying to cover your own ass versus that's really what I did. You know what I mean? So that's, you know, just always have that in the back of your head. I like a lot of nurses here, they'll do one narrative like that, like has like at this time I did this at that, you know. So obviously I'm writing this note after the patient has expired, but here is everything I did because, you know, I didn't have time to go in and do chart. And that's fine. You know, again, I get it. That's fine. You guys are treating a lot of, you know, a lot of people. Some people drag, you'll drag the computer. Other people don't. Whatever it is, whatever your customer practices, the more you can chart the better from my perspective. And then, um, that's it. You have to kind of remember just the importance of this document. And it really is a living, breathing, the most important piece of evidence more than any, any means. The end all, the be all, Bible, the Torah. I don't know enough about other religions to like give more examples. Any questions, you guys? <laughs> the online folks, any questions before we sign off? No? Okay. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's figure out how to make this up. The video. Uh, and where's my Zoom? Here it is. Here. Jess? Yeah. Um, I'm in work tomorrow. I'll get you that for the pals tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, dear. <laughs> okay, leave. Leave meeting. Okay, that's what I wanted. Perfect.